Good morning, and welcome to Mass Memorial Virtual Sunday School presentation. The theme for the quarter, Partners in a New Creation, Unit 3, The Great Hope of the Saints, lesson for Sunday, August 7, 2022. The lesson is entitled, A New Home, and it comes from Revelation 21, 1 through 8. The key verse and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 4, King James Version. The aim for our lesson today is to examine the unique genre of apocalypse, apocalypse that characterizes Revelation in order to discern how to understand this message and to contemplate the creation of a new heaven and a new earth for the hope that this vision holds for the faithful. And finally, to embrace the peace of God that begins in this life with Jesus and continues in God's new creation. Our lesson background, much of this lesson background has been covered by Ms. Griffin in some of our previous lessons. So I'm not going to be as detailed, but I will bring up some of the main points. The book of Revelation um, is the last book in the Bible, and it records the four visions of John. The first vision is of Jesus and his message to the seven churches. The second vision is Jesus Christ at the throne of God, the opening of the seven seals and the seven trumpets blasts. The third vision describes Christ on Mount Zion. The fourth vision is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise in Christ, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. The book of Revelation contains a lot of imagery, and this fourth vision is probably the easiest one to understand from a layman's standpoint. About John, John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He is believed to be the author of the three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, as well as the book of Revelation. His brother of James, son of Zebedee, John was believed to be on, in Jesus' inner circle. And uh, those people considered to be in his inner circle were Peter, James, and John. And these three people also was with Jesus when when he was going to on the going through transfiguration they were also present with him in the garden of gethsemane just before he was arrested and john was also at the crucifixion and this is when jesus instructed john to take care of his mother the other key word in our lesson background is the isle of patmos it's one of the smallest of the greek isles in the aegean which still exists it is often referred to as the Jerusalem of the Aegean, or the island of the Apocalypse. This is where John was sent and abandoned by the Roman government for preaching the gospel. John is one of the few disciples that was not martyred in the sense of being stoned or hung or imprisoned in a, a, what we know as a jail. And we look at our patterns at the time was considered to be in a wilderness. Um, nothing there. However, in our present day time, it houses uh, a monastery atop for one of the mountains. So the Isle of Patton was, con was considered a um, very desolate, very isolated place. And he was put there because he was preaching this new gospel of Jesus Christ. Also in our lesson, it talks about a bride. And we know as we think of brides, uh, a person who is waited to a bridegroom. And the word bride is used throughout the Old Testament and also um, it's used in the New Testament. Um, this, this bride in the Old Testament, it, it talks about um, bride being faithful to God. And in the Old Testament, it had reference to Israel, who was very unfaithful. And so... Um, in the New Testament, uh, it talks about the ways that the bride is, is also being unfaithful to God. And the other part of this lesson talks about the bridegroom. 
And in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> the word bride applies to the church in her relationship to Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. And we often hear that he's coming back for his church, which means he's going to come back and be reunited with his bride. Our lesson scripture, the first scripture, Revelation 21, 1 through 2, talks about the presentation. And uh, I will read both of these verses and then discuss them. Revelation 21 and 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21, 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Here we see all of the imagery with the bride and um, husband, bridegroom. Okay, in the 21 and 1, it talks about John. It was revealed to John that there would be a new heaven and a new earth. And this is important because if if you know the creation, the, the new creation when God created Adam and Eve, um, the first creation, created Adam and Eve. So this new creation will be um, the new church. It would not be a physical situation. It would be a spiritual situation. And so <clears throat> this is a place, this new Jerusalem and this first heaven and first earth when he says passed away, we're talking about the physical earth as we know it now. But the new earth would be a transformed place. It will not be a physical uh, lumber and soil and all of that. It would be um, a, a, a new transformation. And um, when the author talks about, and there was no more sea, this is important because we think of the sea. I don't know if any of you have ever seen, um, or some of you have been in hurricanes. You know that the sea can be very um, powerful. It can also be very destructive. And it also can be very calm. And so John made reference that there would be no more sea. There would be no more uh, movement of the waters as we know it. And then he talks about what else he saw. He said that um, he saw a new holy city, a new Jerusalem. And this means that um, sin would be destroyed in, in this new relationship. There would be no more sin. And this new place would be a fitting place for the bride, which would be the church. And it would be a place for this new relationship to occur. And we, we see that Jerusalem is mentioned in this, in this verse. And remember, Jerusalem had a lot of significance because in, it relates to the law. And we talked about lessons that dealt with the law a long time ago um, and, and how important Paul talked about the people getting so engrossed in the law that they couldn't accept this new uh, religion that, that Jesus was bringing forth. So this new Jerusalem means that there will be freedom from the law and all its restrictions. That's what this means. And um, John uh, Christ made sure that this was put in there because the people could relate to Jerusalem as being the center of where the laws began. It was, it, it could be looked upon as our, like our capital. You know, the temple is, is where the worship was and where all of the Jewish laws came from. So this new beginning is what John is seeing here. A new heaven, a new earth, a new place coming down and to get the church, to get the bride. And so it also implies that this bride, it says the bride has been prepared and adorned for her husband. The preparation and the adornment is occurring now. And that's one thing we need to realize. It's not going to happen then. It's, it's our preparation now. We're preparing to meet Jesus 
through our way of life and through our living as we know it now. So that when he comes, we'll be ready. And so um, it, it's often something to think about. Um, it says, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, I don't know, sometimes many weddings, the bride is late or the groom is late. Uh, that could be not a good situation. So if you aren't ready when Christ returns, you might get left out. And so that's kind of what this implies, that the church has been preparing for his return. The next verses, verses 3 and 4, deals with the proclamation, means to proclaim. I'll read verses 3 and 4. And Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation 21 and 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And after time, we hear these verses um, in many of our funerals, or many of our burial ceremonies, things that won't ever, won't be again for that person. You know, no more tears, no more pain. Um, when John talks about, uh, in, in the Old Testament, where it says, um, the tabernacle of God is with men. In the Old Testament, the, tab <clears throat> the tabernacle was considered a place where God dwelled with his people. And in the New Testament, God would dwell among us. And as we proceed and we transform, we will become with, we will be with him in terms of the spiritual self, the presence of, we don't have to no longer have faith because we will be with him. We, his faith will manifest itself. Our faith will manifest itself with him. So we no longer have to literally just stay faithful because we will be in his presence. That's what this means, that we will dwell with him. And um, so in when he talks about um, he will be with them and they shall be his people. We see this throughout the Old Testament. I will be their God and they, they shall be my people. And so this is really what it's all about. Christ coming back for his church and his people. And he and as we get to this new heaven and the new holy city, we will live in the fullness of God's presence. And that's a powerful statement. And we no longer have to accept his presence by faith because we will be with him spiritually. So this is this is Something to think about. Maybe a little hard to realize, but it's something to think about. That we, we no longer have to say, well, I'm faithful. You know, you if you are, you will be with him. And Christ really wants his church to be with him. And he has made, um, kind of making us ready to be with him by showing us how to get there. Remember, he came down as man and showed us how to live, how to treat each other. And so he's laid the foundation for us to, to be with him. As he said, to be adorned, a bride being adorned, waiting for, for the bridegroom. Um, and when it talks about there should be no more sorrow, no more pain, these are earthly woes. These are physical earthly things. And this is a wonderful promise and proclamation. And it actually gives us something to look forward to. Um, it's, it's really quite something to imagine. No more crying, no more, no more death. Death in the physical sense as we know it. And there will be no more sorrow. And all the old things shall pass away. And it will be a new heaven and a new earth. So these two verses are actually part of the promise of eternal life, part of the promise 
that God gives us for our spiritual obedience to him. Finally, the promise of revelation. Um, I'm going to deal with verses 5 and 6 first, and then I will read verses 7 and 8. Revelation 21 and 5. And he that sat up on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Revelation 21, 6. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is at thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. These are some words that have also been uttered into, in the book of Isaiah. But let's deal with verse 5 first where he says, uh, I will make all things new. This is a promise of the new heaven and the new earth. And God is, is now in the process of creating that new home for us, the holy city. He won't just do it at the last minute. He's, he's working on it as we, as we sit. And if in the book of Isaiah, it says, God says, Behold, I will do a new thing. This is Old Testament. This is, this is, this is really uh, amazing that in the book of Isaiah, much of Christ's beginning and end is, is, is predicted. And so um, he's gone and he's preparing a place to take care of his bride. It's very similar to if people get married, you know, in many countries, you have to have a dowry, which is, it could be monetary, it could be property, it could be jewelry, but something has to be presented to the bride. So this new holy city is what God is preparing so that Christ and his church can, can unite. Okay, and in, the, in the verse 6, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give him... That is a thirst, a new fountain. Remember um, when he met the lady at the well, he said, you know, I will make living water. Well, you will thirst no more. So this is all reference to Christ doing a new thing. And these words are also echoed in the book of Isaiah, 44 chapter and the sixth verse. And it says, only um, when we dwell in the new city, Will our thirst for God be replaced by his, by his eternal presence? Now we desire to know him, and um, we want to know him, and we're in the process of learning him. But as we become a part of him in the new city, in the new Jerusalem, we'll no longer have that desire because we will be in his presence. We, we will um, be with him. And... Even though um, God created man to make his own choice, he did not make it for him. He actually, leave, he's leaving it up to you. If you want to be his bride, you know what you have to do. And so he, do, he does not, he gives man free will to choose him as his, as his groom. Um, Je, uh, Jesus talks about the beginning and the end when we, we hear him say Alpha and Omega. This is echoed throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the beginning and the end. And the book of Revelations is not any different. He, Christ, God, is the beginning and also the end. Going on to the rest of the promise, um, Revelations 21, 7 and Revelation 21, 8. Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers, the homongers, the sorcerers, the adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, these are some powerful, powerful verses. And these verses says, if you don't want to take a part and don't want to be a part of the promise, and you don't want to overcome so that you can be with Christ in his new creation. Um, 
the word overcome here means to be victorious. And um, when we think of um, being victorious, we all want to be victorious. And Christians are expected to be conquerors and to hold fast, hold fast to the faith. And it does not mean that you won't be allowed to be tempted and presented with things that that we feel we, that we know that are not right. But it's through God's promise that he will be with us and provide us with the Holy Spirit to overcome these things that we are able to be victorious. Uh, in the first epistle, John also talks about conquerors. <clears throat> Christians should be conquerors. They should not be fearful. And, and in the next verse, it talks about people that are fearful. Fearful means there's a lack of faith somewhere. Um, if you have the faith, oftentimes you have very little fear, little no fear, because faith overcomes fear. So in the, in the Revelation um, 21 and 8, this, um, these verses go back to, um, we talked about several lessons ago, fruit, the fruit of the Spirit and then those things that were not fruit of the Spirit. And this is a powerful verse. He promises those Christians who have been victorious that they would be with him. But he also promises that if you have not been victorious and you have been unfaithful, unbelieving, and have gone through all these other um, worldly things, that you have a different home. And he, he, in the book of Revelation, uh, we, he called it the lake of fire and brimstone, and oftentimes I guess we refer to it as hell. And, but it's also referred to as a second death. And this is a harsh reality, but I don't know if it really dawns on us how harsh it can be. You know, if you if you think about when you stick your finger in a fire, you get burned. It doesn't take very much before you decide that's not that's not the right thing to do. And so he says, those who have been uh, fearful, which means that you have not stay true to the faith and you've been unbelieving and the abominable are those who have allowed themselves to be saturated with the sinfulness of the world in other words you're so far out there that you don't want to come back or you can't come back from what you're doing in the world you enjoying it to the point that you he called these people abominable and fearful mean that you are tim timid and cowardly and in, it implies that you don't have enough faith. And in this scripture, he mentions liars, kind of in a different context than what we like to think of it. In this context of Revelation, it says, liars are those who are insincere, are those who lie by silence, are those who practice any other kind of untruth. Um, you know, oftentimes, if you if you knew, know in some meetings, you sit silent. Silence also gives consent, and it can give consent to what's wrong, as well as what's right. So, in a sense of liars, in terms of this lesson, is those who are insincere, and those who lie by their silence. And we also there are those who create stories lies as we call them and in that would take on a, a new meaning in our day and age from what this new testament um suggests but oftentimes uh, liars are the source of conflict of frustration for other people for other organizations and even within the church you know it talks about the power of the tongue it can destroy an organization internally, and Paul talked about that when in his, his uh, letters to the churches at Corinth, that they were going to be destroyed from within based on false practices and false, false teaching. So here again, um, you have different ways of presenting an untruth, but it's all classified in a group called liars. And as we as we look at um, 
this, this scripture, there's an implication that you don't have to submit yourself forever to the sins of the world. It says what God expects us to do is ask for forgiveness and ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to improve ourselves. And so this is this is an important point. You know, people always say, well, I remember when they used to be the town drunk. I don't mean they have to be the town drunk now. People don't want to give other people a chance. So one thing a person has to do is to go to God first and ask for guidance in the Holy Spirit. Then when Miss Sally come along and say, I, I remember when you used to be the town drunk, you have a different answer for her. I may have been that then, but I'm not that now. And so we have to be strong and that, that would be our part as a conqueror, but you can't do it by yourself. Uh, part of this is, this verse eight has to do with recognizing and taking responsibility and asking God for forgiveness for what we have done. He includes a whole list of, of people here, um, all kinds of people. And remember these people have become a part of the world to the point that they oftentimes don't see themselves as doing anything wrong. There are some people who say, well, I don't have any reason to ask for forgiveness because I haven't done anything wrong. These are very dangerous people. Um, when, you, when you hear somebody say that, they can be very dangerous. And when you come across people like that, you have to be very prayerful. You really have to be a very strong person in order to be victorious and not become a part of their play or a part of their ploy in, in, um, in what they're trying to do. This, this is a, a good lesson. And it, it gives us something to look forward to if we look at it that way. And it's probably the easiest of all the, the books, the um, presentations in Revelation to understand. Um, and like I said, the book of Revelation has a lot of imagery. And those previous three visions are very um, stark in their imagination. They, they present some dire situations as to what will happen in the process of Christ getting his bride to be with him and separating them from the people who have not been faithful to him. From practical application for today, um, if we look at this lesson in terms of um, people getting married, um, people get excited about getting a new wife or a new husband, at least they should be. Um, and we as Christians should be excited about meeting our bride, bridegroom, which is um, which will be Christ. And um, oftentimes when people get married, they start out, sometimes they have a car, they have a house, they have new things. They even move sometimes to a new location. And that's what Revelation is saying in this fourth vision. I'm gonna move my bridegroom, my bride to a new location, a new heaven, a new holy city. And John says, this new heaven is a reward for staying faithful. You know, oftentimes in marriages, when people stay faithful, the husband will say, well, we're going to get a new house or we're going to get a new car. I'm going to give you a brand new Mercedes or whatever. So this is no different. It's just that Christ is saying, you're going to have a new home. And who doesn't like a new house? So this is something for us to look forward to. It means you're going to move to a different location, a new heaven, a new earth, and a different lifestyle. And what better thing can you ask when you get married and you look at Christ as your bridegroom? It's a lot to look forward to. But on the other side of that, God expects us to be faithful and to love him as well as love one another, which is the second part of that commandment. And if we're over, able to overcome our doubts and fears through the presence of the Holy Spirit, then we can count on receiving the promise that God has given us. And we can take him at his word. God does not lie. He always keeps his promise. If you look in the Old Testament, 
He promised the children of Israel many things. He never reneged on his promise. They did. They, they, even when he brought them out of Egypt, they got to the point they wanted to go back. They got, they started worshiping the Isle of God. So he never breaks his promise. So in the book of Revelation, he leaves us something to think about. And he tells us how to get there. And we can realize that once we become mature in the faith and our fears and doubts are removed, then we are well on our way to this new heaven and new earth. And so this morning, I hope you've gotten something out of the lesson. Just remember, this is a promise. This is something for us to look forward to as Christians. And it lets us know what we have to do. And who doesn't want to be without um, tears and doubts and crying? That's a beautiful promise. So as we go from day to day, let's keep this lesson in mind in terms of what we got to look forward to. So please stay tuned next Sunday for our continued virtual Sunday school. And we thank you for listening.